Michael Bile. I'm a professor here in the Aerospace and Ocean Engineering Department. Um, you're standing inside of the Aerospace Structures and Materials Lab. Generally, when we do this, we have the students come through and <clears throat> we have a bunch of hands on activities that we usually have to do. Um, fortunately, we're not able to do that, but our volunteer Carson has agreed to do it himself. And he will get shot later on. <laughs> so, um, so what I wanted to do today was first give like a 25, 30 minutes of presentation and then spend the remainder of the time doing some hands-on stuff. Okay. So you'll see Carson in the background running around and cleaning up. But <clears throat> so let me um, switch over. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. So I don't know if you've heard of uh, smart materials, but today I wanted to talk about smart materials, intelligent structures, and even some <coughs> other items such as biologically inspired systems. These are all things that I'm very interested in doing. And so the question is, what are smart materials? Well, <coughs> that's the question. So smart materials are basically materials that respond to a stimuli. So by applying maybe a voltage, the uh, material will change shape, something like that, or by heating it up or cooling it down. And so <clears throat> there's various types of smart materials that we're gonna talk about today. One is piezoelectric, it's a little ceramic, shape memory alloy, shape memory polymers, magneto-rheological fluids, magneto-restrictive materials, piezo-restrictive materials, and even materials that heal themselves. And a lot of these are we're gonna talk about today. <clears throat> and so, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but there's these plots where you can go and say, okay, if I want this much displacement or this much stress, I can pick out the material that I want. So you have displacement and stress, and you can pick out the materials you want. And over here, you can look at how fast they are as opposed to how strong they are. So we have these tables that we, we can use where we, we can find out which materials that we want to use for a particular application. So I first wanted to talk about piezoelectric materials. Uh, these are materials that when you, uh, they have an electromechanical coupling effect. So when you squeeze on it, like this piezoceramic, as I'm squeezing on it, I'm generating a voltage, okay? <clears throat> and the opposite is true, is that if I apply a voltage to this, I can make this move or change shape. These are very fast, high frequency, very strong, but very little displacement, okay? And they come in all different forms and shapes. Um, you can buy these uh, off the shelf. And we have, uh, we'll show you some of these uh, later on. But, um, and they're used in a lot of applications. So what's some ex examples? Well, Carson's gonna show in a little bit, like, uh, it's childproof, here we go. <laughs> no, it's childproof. <laughs> so that has a piezoelectric um, a ceramic inside of it. So when you, <clears throat> when the hammer hits it, it generates a voltage, a very high voltage, and it causes this uh, spark to happen. Piezoelectric microphones on guitars, we have fuel injectors for diesel engines. We have a lot of these as far as strand gauges and accelerometers in our lab. Um, piezoelectric motors, even some of the Epson printers have these for controlling the direction or where the ink flows up to the paper. And nano positioning, so a lot of companies will sell these uh, very high precise um, positioners. And like I said, if you, as I squeeze on this, I'm generating a voltage, which means that if I put this into some kind of system that's vibrating, say like your shoes, where all the little kids have the, the, the blinking um, shoes, right? But if I were to put a piezoelectric inside of the shoe, we could think about harvesting that energy and charging the batteries and using it for other things. <clears throat> um, other applications are morphing control system so getting rid of all these uh, uh, control surfaces these hinges and using these for doing morphing and I, I have a video here that I want to show you this is a senior design team and you can see the there are no hinges this is just the, these uh, smart materials that are causing the control sur surfaces to deform <coughs> And 
So this was a group of mechanical engineering, oops, mechanical engineering students. And the one thing I want to show you is that about them not being aerospace is this. <clears throat> so if they had some aerospace students, that wouldn't have happened. <laughs> anyway. <clears throat> so another smart material is shape memory alloys. Okay. And there's a lot of verbiage here that I don't want to talk about. But the idea is that you have a, <clears throat> a metal that when you heat it up will change shape. Okay, it will contract. And you can use these as muscle wires. Often that's what they're called, are muscle wires. Okay. <clears throat> so people have used these in robotics, right? So I've got, <clears throat> got a little butterfly here that's using an SMA wire. That apparently it's not plugged in. There he goes. You can see it, right? So we can use these as muscle wires. And we can also use these for doing morphing as well. So you attach these to a, a, a structure and you can bend the structure using these muscle wires. <clears throat> so I have a few applications. So you could think of this as a curtain, right? So when the, <clears throat> when it gets hot during the day, these, these curtains might open up or close and allow air to pass through or possibly prevent the uh, sun from coming through. And all it is is just a little piece of wire that's attached to it. <clears throat> Pretty nifty. Um, next one. So you could do like some kind of cool origami stuff where you have these SMA wires embedded in the structure and you can activate it and the structures will do various things. What about those uh, curtains that you sometimes see where you, you pass through? Um, Pretty cool. Imagine going into a room and the curtains kind of open up and allow you to pass through. And it's all just SMA wires. Oh, this one's pretty neat. So imagine in your dorm room, you have one of these, um, maybe it's a light fixture. Turn on the light, it heats up, and this, this flower basically opens up, and, you know, and it allows light to come on. So you can, they're using a heater, but you can think of a light bulb doing this as it heats up, right? And then as you turn the light off, it closes back up. So. And people like to do um, bio-inspired. So this jellyfish uses SMA wires to contract the jellyfish, and you can see it's swimming. These were done by mechanical engineers, so they're better at doing underwater than they are aerial vehicles. That's it. <laughs> they're pulling out, I guess. So very cool stuff. <clears throat> Another material, smart material, magnetorheological fluid. So I've got a whole bunch of it right here. And basically it's a fluid that has some oil with a bunch of tiny uh, micron sized iron particles in it. And so when you put a magnet onto it, that fluid goes from being sloshy to something that's very stiff. Okay, it locks up and it's basically, um, basically it's because the um, magnetic particles are aligning with the magnetic field. And so you can use these for doing uh, various things, which we're going to show you later on with the hands on. Carson's over there stirring it right now. And let's see. So he's using an electromagnet. And Carson's going to translate for you. <laughs> so very cool. So we'll, we'll actually get to see this here in a little bit. It's pretty neat. But what are some applications for this? Well, 
These are actually in uh, many of your vehicles or many vehicles that I cannot afford. Uh, my Jeep, unfortunately, does not have this. Um, <coughs> but the idea is that you have a shock. You can take this shock, let's say, here's one that Carson will talk about here in a little bit, but you can take, this is a tiny little shock for an RC car, but you take a shock and take out the regular oil and put in the MR fluid, the magnetobiological fluid, and when you apply an electromagnetic field um, <coughs> using electricity, it basically will allow you to change the damping and the stiffness of this shock absorber. And so GM is calling this the active ride suspension. Um, and they've used this in all of their high-end cars like the Corvette. This car is the Cadillac XLR, which they quit making in 2009, but it's uh, one of my favorite cars that's built on top of the Corvette chassis. Um, so, but it's in a lot of, a lot of cars now, as far as the active ride suspension. So what are, <coughs> So now when I take smart materials, like this, a piezoelectric, and I put it into a structure, and that structure becomes intelligent, we call those adaptive structures. And there's a few examples of this. So one are adaptive optics, right? So a lot of times, you know, if you want to land-based telescopes, if they're trying to look through the atmosphere, the, the images become distorted by um, atmospheric turbulence. So by placing a bunch of these actuators on the mirror, you can adjust and change the shape of the mirror. So like the one in the middle has 3,000 PCT actuators that can control the shape of the mirror. Um, <clears throat> Boeing has put this on the chevrons of a, a jet engine for controlling the noise. So when you're landing or taking off, you want your jet engine to be quiet, as quiet as possible, and then when you're air, you up flying when there's no people around you can allow it to be loud again right so they're using these sma wires even out in space there's you know my my phd work was in the idea of um, development of a uh, shape and vibration control of a large space here and we're talking very large but when you're in space as you rotate around you have gravitational effects and you have thermal effects and you have to compensate for that so you can do that using smart materials and my last section of this talk is on biologically inspired systems. So when I first started here at Virginia Tech, one of my first projects was developing a biologically inspired fish, which I'm gonna show you a video here in a little bit. Um, but you know, think about it for years. <laughs> I mean, myself as a child, just growing up, I've always wanted to be uh, Superman, right? Or uh, Flash, I thought I was fast. Or Spider-Man, right? Or even, I had the Wonder Woman out there, you know, so I had all these um, inspirations of biology uh, that uh, has kind of inspired me over the years. And so one of the things that we've been working on in this lab is the idea of morphing. And what I mean by morphing is, <clears throat> if you look at aircraft, you know, they're typically designed for one flight regime, right? So they don't, but ideally, if you wanted to take off, land, loiter, and dive, you want something to do like what I show on the right side, right? You want this plane to change shape and that way you can fly optimally for diff uh, different flight conditions and so there have been some um, some research in the past doing this like this is an experimental aircraft where you have swept wings if you've ever seen top gun uh, tom cruise he's he flies an f-14 which is also a swept wing type uh, design right even like something as simple as velcro was developed just from looking at biology. So this uh, gentleman back in the 40s was tired of pulling out these uh, burdock seeds out of his dog's tail, right, or his, his fur. But then he looked at it and up close and he's like, this is interesting. These, hoop, these hooks and loops are, uh, you know, they could be beneficial. So he ended up coming with the patent on the uh, Velcro. Um, shark skin, I don't know if anybody or any scuba divers or uh, swimmers, this is the um, Speedo, I forget what they call it, but it's a it's basically they get the inspiration from the shark skin, right? So this is an up close picture of the denticles on the surface of the shark. Uh, that's Dr. Louder that I've worked with in the past over at Harvard. He's probably got a million fish and bottles under his lab. Uh, world famous for his uh, research in uh, biomechanics. But you know, that, like I'm saying, um, Speedo came up with the suit inspired by shark skin. This is Frank Fish. Um, I had the pleasure of working with him, and conveniently, his last name is Fish, and he likes to work with fish, right? And so over here is the top is the humpback 
well, and on the leading edge of the humpback well are these um, these bumps or ridges, right? And what that allows them to do is it allows them to rotate their fins at a much higher angle and still maintain width, right? And that's what we say stall is that eventually if you rotate up high enough, you lose width and you fall, you drop. But so he took that inspiration and came up with this wind turbine blade where he's got these humps on the leading edge. And fish, people come up with all kinds of robotic designs, right? So here's the bottom is a, a robotic device that uh, George Rotter was a part of. Um, it's a knife fish. But knife fish can do all kinds of undulations just by controlling the, the wave propagation along that bottom fin. And MIT, they have the Robotunos, which were um, uh, very well known using actuators and muscles and skeletons and uh, stuff like that. Um, let's see if this works. So not too long ago, we um, <coughs> DARPA funded this project, right? And it's called the, um, it's inspired uh, by hummingbird flight. Hummingbirds have a unique way of uh, flapping their wings. And this company developed this, oh, there it is. You can see it, but it flies just like a hummingbird. And so why would, a defense company or a uh, defense government spend all kinds of money on developing a, a hummingbird or a fake hummingbird. Well, if it's if it looks like a hummingbird and it flies like a hummingbird, then people are not going to pay any attention to it. They'll just ignore it unless it's in the desert or something where you're not going to have a hummingbird, right? But nonetheless, the idea is that for stealth operations and surveillance. Um, <clears throat> Something I've always had some inspiration about is uh, Nastic. Nastic is the motion of plants. And I think everybody's seen the video on the left, right? It's a Venus flytrap. And when you tap that flytrap twice, a double tap, you can see it collapses, right? Okay. And even on the right, we have a mimosa plant. And I need to start that over again because I have some. Uh, Oops. Ah. Okay. So on the, uh, I'm gonna get it. So on the right is a mimosa plant. It's a tropical plant. You can see in the bottom right corner there's a, a lighter, and this is a real time reaction to this heat. It's a protective mechanism, right? And so this heat will um, essentially cause this plant to collapse. Okay. And this was not sped up or anything. This is real time. So that gave us a lot of inspiration years ago. How could we take this idea of large, fast motion that we see in biology and apply that to real systems? And so if you start looking underneath the microscope at a plant cell, they have these fibers, right? And when these, these fibers embedded in the walls, and when the cells become pressurized, these cells will do different types of behavior, meaning they can elongate, they can bend, and it gives them all, it, it basically controls the, the, the displacement or the, the, um, how these things deform. So taking this idea of stiff fibers embedded in the soft elastomer, we come up with uh, what we call flexible matrix composites, and it's basically the same thing. We take stiff fibers, embed them in a soft elastomer. So this is carbon fiber embedded in the soft elastomer. When we pressurize it, we can get different types of behavior. So meaning with here on the top left, we have a flexible matrix composite actuator. Looks like an artificial muscle, like some guys lift, um, some person's lifting in the lab. It's my green screen skills right there. Mm -hmm. Top right is a little guy. It's a, a little actuator in the bottom left. We can get these to twist and we can get these actuators to bend, and it's all about the fiber orientation. Then we can put these actuators in structures, and we can get structures themselves that are adaptive, so we can get something that bends, in plane, out of plane, and twist. So this kind of gave us the inspiration for our biologically inspired fish, right? It looks like a fin, and so I'll show you a little bit of that here in a second. So we can get all kinds of fun uh, behavior out of these. I always forget about the Jaws thing. I don't know. I'm assuming they can hear the Jaws thing. But it looks very real. I mean, if you look at 
other than the styrofoam strapped to the top of it, it looks. Uh, it looks like a it looks like a real fish. It was funded by the Office of Naval Research, and it was really looking at harbor security. So I've always said I wanted to create a fish. It looks like a fish, swims like a fish, and even smells like a fish. So I'm still working on the smell part. Um, a lot of nature, a lot of other um, animals in nature use this idea of stiff fibers embedded in a soft elastomer. I'm sure you can recognize that one of these things below. One's a tongue, the trunk of an elephant. We have an earthworm and a squid, but they all use fibers, um, stiff fibers. And they also use the inc incompressibility of fluid for doing different types of things, for shortening, bending, and stiffening. We call these hydrostats, okay? And squid are my favorite. I mean, they, they can travel up to 25 miles per hour, and they basically have jets. And so these fibers or these muscles are uh, arranged circumferentially around this, this pouch, right? And then when they want a jet, the muscles just squeeze and force that fluid out, and it's... Um, and they have a bunch of other fibers too that oriented us uh, specific directions. But very few people know that squid have been known to fly. You're looking at, you know, these have been measured up to 30 meters. Not too many people have seen squid flying. Uh, this is one of the few images of it actually found on the internet on Google. Um, but yeah, they turn around backwards and they use their fins as canards and they just jet out and then they can, you know, basically fly through the, fly through the air. Um, so taking that inspiration of these fibers and incompressibility of fluid, we've come up with pumps. And the reason why we've come up with pumps is that we're interested in we're interested in doing ocean energy harvesting. So we have which parts I'm we'll demonstrate here in a little bit, but the idea is that there's still some water in here, Carson. <laughs> so the idea is you have one of these that are huge, like this big, 40 meters long, or 120 feet in the ocean. On top of it, you have uh, something that floats. And on the bottom, it's anchored. So as the wave passes, it pumps water out. And Carson's going to demonstrate this a little bit better than I did. Um, but that's the idea is we're using fibers and uh, being compressible to fluid for doing it. Um, and this is just showing that it actually works. We did a test rig and we're pumping water out. Um, we've also, and I'm almost through here, I've also come up with what I call a, not squid, squid. Carson's last name is Squid. I get, I get him and Squid confused all the time. But anyways, this is a, a squid pump using SMA wires. And so you're going to see a video. So when I activate the SMA wires, you're going to see that it's, these wires will contract and force the fluid to come up. So you'll see here, if I turn on the power, I'm pumping water up. Not, it's not going to get you up to 25 miles per hour, but nonetheless, it's, it's, that's pretty neat. And lastly, um, well, second to last, you're all in high school right now. I'm assuming that you're all coming to Virginia Tech. Um, but I encourage you to get involved, meaning maybe not your freshman year, get acclimated to the the campus and the, the, the environment, but your sophomore year, junior year, reach out to faculty, knock on doors, um, try to get involved in possibly undergraduate research. And we've had, I've had success over the years with uh, various outreach programs, um, such as an, an outreach program such as this, right? So just, um, I encourage you to get involved when you go to school, I mean, college. And lastly, I'd like to uh, give thanks to these um, folks that have donated. Dyna Alloy, they, they produced the SMA wires. They've donated quite a few of the things that we're going to show you. And General Motors uh, for um, also donated some um, items to the group. So with that, I'm going to let Carson take over, and we're going to demonstrate some end of me exit out of this and stop sharing. There we go. And to practice social distancing, I've got this uh, cam on a very long pole that I can maneuver around. 
How close is <laughs> <to> that close? <laughs> I'm not. Oh, I thought, okay, I got to make sure I'm doing this right. Okay, yeah. go ahead. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Carson Squibb. I'm a PhD student here. I actually started in the lab when I was 17 in high school. Uh, did an unpaid internship in my school and been here ever since. Like, he hasn't changed a bit. He still looks the same. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Dr. Brown talked about a bunch of different smart materials and applications. Um, so we'll just go through some different examples of these different smart materials and then how they can be used and seeing them in action. Um, the first that we're going to look at are these piezoelectric materials that we talked about. So he, he showed one of these wafers you can see here. So it's just basically a ceramic wafer. And again, if you press on it, you generate a voltage. Um, now, these are ones that you've probably seen in your everyday life, but you may not have noticed. Um, Dr. Feynman showed the example of your standard grill lighter, uh, where when you fire it, you can hear there's a click before it ignites. And what that click actually is, you have one of the mechanisms pulled out from it. Um, it's this small percussive um, element, essentially a hammer that's hitting on one of these piezoelectric materials. And it may be pretty hard to see. But when it's hitting, there's actually a small spark being generated that's able to ignite the butane that's inside of the igniter, of the um, grill lighter. So that's what happens if you apply force to it to generate voltage, but you can also do the opposite. Um, if you apply a signal of voltage across it, you can generate motion. And one of the common examples that are used are in cheap speakers. So that's what this is, a cheap little speaker that you often find in children's toys and items like that. We're looking for a small, um, inexpensive, uh, energy efficient speaker. Um, so we can actually demonstrate that. Show down here, this is a macrofiber composite. So it has these rods of piezoelectric materials in it. And what we can do is apply high voltage across it. Should apologize for your taste. Uh, my Toy some music. very outdated taste in music. <laughs> I do apologize in advance. But what you can see so you can play music across it, and that's coming just from this wafer here. Sounds on the speaker on the amplifier, which is loud. So that's just showing it for a wafer. Now you can also scale these up for larger speakers. If we have an example here. Okay. Now that's what this big box is. It's the same. It's using the same small piezoelectric ceramic um, wafers that are all attached to this diaphragm. And this functions like much larger speakers where you basically have a closed air chamber and then you just have to excite this membrane. Um, typical speakers will use something like electro uh, motors, electric motors. Um, but in this case, we can use these piezoelectric materials. Um, now, normally, if you're in person, you can actually feel this membrane and feel it vibrating because of these piezoelectric materials acting on it. Well, it's a great question. <laughs> I built this when I was a freshman at um, for C Tech Squared specifically. Oh, head in on that. His name is. I can't see your name. <laughs> no, that was intentional. <laughs> Um, so those are some examples of piezoelectric materials. We can next look at shape and alloys. So, so we have shape and alloy materials. Conventional springs like this, if you pull on it too much, it will deform and it won't return. But a shape and alloy material like this, you can see it's just a spring. But if I pull on it, so I plastically deformed it's not I returning. Ruined it. Oh, only there was a way to repair it. <laughs> <laughs> so shape and alloys up, act under heat. So once I heat it back up, you can see it returns back to its original shape. Oh, I was worried there. <laughs> so that's showing simply how they work. Then you can think about how you could um, generate power or some kind of motion of this that'd be useful. So that's what we have here, just a quick little setup showing a flipper essentially with a shipmember alloy coiled actuator. You can see 
that you can actually get a flapping motion out of it if you were to activate the ship memory alloy. You can see it's able to get a reasonably fast response. Um, they have higher forces and you get pretty large deformations out of them. I think Dr. Fallon already showed you our GM butterfly that yeah. perpetually flaps and this does so by having little shape memory alloy wire um, across the span of the wings so that it periodically turns on and that's what causes the wing flapping. Cute. So next, we can show we have a ship memory alloy heat engine. So this is a ship memory alloy coil that runs up and down on this pulley system. What we can do is set into a bath with hot and cold water. So again, these activate based on temperature. Um, that's what we'll show here. So cold water goes in blue, Carson? I believe so. <laughs> As you have told me. Oh, and then Carson's leaving. Where did he go? <laughs> so this is the lab while Carson's coming back. So you, that's hot water. It goes into red one, right? Yes. <laughs> this is definitely my burning hands right now. <laughs> All right, a little bit more cold water in. So what's going to happen when I put this in, hopefully, <laughs> is that the part of the coil actuator that's in the hot side uh, will be contracting. And then so it'll contract, pull over more lengths. Maybe not more lengths. That's why we have two. And I mess up the first one. Um, it'll pull and then rotate from the cold side in. Yeah. So you can see, typically you have to give it a jump start. See so how you can get usable power out of these. Um, and in this case, it's just by the temperature differential between the hot and cold water, um, or you can do it through electric current. So it's just about heating the actuator. So we've looked over um, these electric materials, shape memory alloys. Now we can look at magnetorheological fluids or MR fluids. Now you maybe have seen these before. Um, oftentimes they can be called ferrofluids. But again, it's basically just an oil with these small iron particles, magnetic particles embedded in it. So you can see it starts off as a very low viscosity oil. And then with application of a magnetic field, in this case, a rare earth magnet, you can see how it becomes quite solid. as it's aligning with the magnetic field lines. So I can pull up the side. You can see that you can move this fluid around. Now, hopefully you can see that these are aligning with the magnetic field. And again, they're still quite soft. <laughs> and then you can just realign them with the magnetic field. I think Dr. Feinlein showed you the example of Corvette and some of the cars where they can be used in shocks of automobiles. I showed you the small RC power actuator where, in this case, we replaced the working oil in this with the MR fluid. Um, and this wire on the outside, what that is, is just to make an electromagnet, and then you can change the viscosity of the working oil in it to have an adaptive rod in your car, in this case, RC car. Um, so lastly, we'll look at some examples of these FMCs, or flexible matrix composites. So we talked about high stiffness fibers embedded in soft elastomeric matrices. So there are a couple of ways that we have done that. Um, firstly is where we take something like this, it's just a latex tubing. And if you think if you were to close this off and then try to pressurize it, it would just blow up like a balloon. So it would expand in all directions. And then we can use um, these high stiffness, in this case, sleeves, oriented sleeves. In this case, we have carbon fiber. Um, we've also used PET, so this is a plastic sleeving. And then lastly, we have yellow, which is a Kevlar. Um, and with all these sleevings, you can see that if you try to expand it radially, it contracts. So these work like the paper finger traps um, you may have played with as a kid. Don't get your finger stuck, Carson. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to cut the finger off. <laughs> I can't go to a hospital right now. <laughs> <laughs> so you can think what would happen then if you put this rubber bladder inside of one of these sleevings, where then if you pressurize this bladder, it wants to expand in all directions, but the sleeving won't allow that. The high stiffness fibers don't allow that. So as this expands then, what would happen is that the actuator would contract as it tries to get that radial expansion. Um, so that's the principle of how they work. You can show them in action now. 
first thing we have this actuator right here, which again, this is using Kevlar sleeving with a rubber internal bladder. And that when we pressurize it, you can see the actual contraction that we're getting out of it. And then actually doing that, if you're able to see up close, you can see that these high stiffness fibers are actually reorienting as it's contracting. Um, so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I've jumped. So that's an example using Kevlar and using an internal, a separate internal bladder just inside of the um, fiber sleeving. We also have examples like this. Now, this is one of those uh, ocean pumps that Dr. Feynman was talking about. And these we made differently. Here we used a plastic sleeving and then we embedded it inside of um, a liquid elastomer that then we allowed to cure. So everything's all in one here. The fiber's embedded into um, the rubber tubing effectively. We can do the same thing here that when we pressurize it, you can see that it contracts axially. So that's something that you can use as an actuator. And then what we did for the um, ocean wave energy harvesting is we use the same actuators in reverse. So in, instead of pressurizing this and have it contract, um, what you can do is you can pull on it and have it push fluid out. Because um, as you're deforming it actually, you're changing the volume inside of the actuator. So as you talked about, these would be oriented vertically where the bottom would be fixed and then the top would ride with the waves. And that would provide that axial deformation, which would be able to pump ocean water that then you can pass through um, either a turbine to be able to generate electricity or, for example, as we looked at, um, being able to desalinate ocean water so you could push it on shore and then be able to take the salt out of it. So I'll demonstrate how this works. There he has some water in it. Yeah, I just covered that while we go when I was... Yeah. <laughs> um, so you can, it's slowly pumping up water until there we go. So now you can see on every pump, it's able to refill and then pump out water. Um, and these are very efficient. You're able to get efficiencies of over 70% of these pumps. And then they actually are able to generate very high pressures. So you can use this basically as an improvised squirt gun. Okay, we'll show, I'm not trying to hit anything important. I don't know, it's a computer. <laughs> so, I'm going to tell Bob's able to squirt that and pull over 30 feet to the back of the lab quite easily. So, that's showing that, yeah, these same pumps can be used both as actuators or like this as pumps, just depending on whether you're pressurizing the inside or pulling on it to go to push flow out. I think that's most of the examples. We can show Sticky up right. at the front of the lab. There's Sticky. Well, did you tell them why it was called I Sticky? I forgot to tell them why it's called Sticky. So Sticky here, all this back translucent part is made out of a silicone rubber. Um, and when these are first cast, they're quite tacky. So they're actually sticky to the touch. And that's where Sticky got his name, because it took several years for him to no longer be sticky. Basically just get a nice <laughs> coat of dust <laughs> to get rid of that. Um, so you can see it's actually quite compliant. And it just has these same... Um, FMC actuators on either side of it, so that when you pressurize one side or the other, you'll get a uh, flapping motion, much like a fish. Um, we've also taken these same actuators and put them in devices such as this. This is a trailing edge of a wing um, for a control surface of an aircraft. Um, and it has these same actuators. I was saying you should get the socket, too. Oh, the socket. Um, it has these same actuators on the top and bottom. So that, much like one of the structures that Dr. Fahman showed a video of, when you pressurize these, you can control deflection up or down. In this case, it was for an aileron on a wing on a commercial aircraft. Um, you're able to get very high forces, large deflections out of these. Um, it's very simple. So this would just bolt onto the back of a wing as opposed to having something like a hinge and servo jacks um, as a conventional aircraft have. Um, I'll show one more example. <coughs> Yeah, this one's a project that we just got funded. Pretty exciting. So one of, this is a, a carbon fiber socket for an amputee, a lower leg amputee. And one of the problems that people that are amputees have is that the volume of their limb changes throughout the day just based on level of exertion and fluid pressure within their limb. 
But these sockets, I mean, you can see this is carbon fiber, it's cast to fit with one size. Um, so what they typically have to do is use different socks or shims to be able to adjust the size of the fit um, to their limb as that changes volume. And that's not precise and it can become uncomfortable throughout the day as so they keep having to take it off and adjust the fit. So what we did, our idea, um, was to take the same FMC actuators, much like this, and then make coils out of them. So that's all this is, is one of those actuators that's coiled up into a spiral. And I mentioned for the wave energy research that we had done, that you can use these um, to change volume. So as the geometry of these change, the volume changes. So what these are used for then is we can pressurize these and they'll get thicker. So it's think of it as like an adaptable shim that you can use. Um, so the socket then you can see it has these bolts on it where one of these would fit in inside. So that based on how the fit of the limb is, so based on how much pressure is being exerted on this, it will pressurize or depressurize. It will change fit for the person, be able to have a more comfortable fit, and no longer force them to have to take off their limb to adjust the fit throughout the day. Yeah. So those are three or four of the examples of these FMC actuators. I think that's all I have to show. Okay. Um, so I noticed there's questions in the... I'm going to put my stick back up here. Some questions in the chat box, which um, we have a few minutes. Except one of Okay. Using the earphones. Oh, the uh, piezoelectric wafer speakers. Um, in some cheap earphones, you can find them. Um, the problem with these is they don't get very good low frequency responses. So you can't get good bass out of earphones if you're using these typically, um, which is why oftentimes they use more conventional um, electromagnets and solenoids to be able to get the low frequency response for um, earbuds. Especially if you're going for anything kind of like Bose your buds or Dr. Dre. I'm not sure. Don't object. I don't have music ones, so I can't attest to that. Um, any other questions? Or maybe you can either do it verbally via microphone or just chat in. What engineering major do you see as the most important materials? Um, I would say mechanical engineering is pretty active, and so is aerospace engineering, I think, are the two majors um, that does most of the work with these. All my degrees are in mechanical engineering, so I pretend to know something about aerospace engineering. I try not to judge you for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, mechanical and aerospace probably. Triangle characters. Repeating the same questions. Oh, I see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's two of them. You answer twice. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, is everybody considering uh, Virginia Tech? Okay. I got a nod. Anybody aerospace? Oh, what? Oh, a little bit of a. Okay, I got a thumbs up. Why did you choose that? It's the only person that would give me a job. <laughs> um, it's an uh, Well, I chose engineering because I've always, I don't know, as long as I can remember, I've always been <clears throat> doing stupid stuff in the garage, you know, building things and putting my fingers in light sockets and trying to build airplanes out of cardboard and everything that I should would advise you not to do, um, but um, I just, I knew engineering was for me, and and my degree in mechanical engineering was, <clears throat> and most of my classes were in electrical engineering, um, took a lot of controls courses, so it's, and most of our department is very diverse, we all collaborate, so uh, we have an ocean and aerospace, but many of these faculty just work across the disciplines, so. And how many projects do you have at a time? Uh, we only have maybe two or three projects at a time in the lab. Some people have a lot more. But Carson wastes all my time, so I can't have too many more. <laughs> True. <laughs> babysitting. What's up? It's babysitting. No, it's, it's babysitting, babysitting. us. 
There's a lot of babies sitting in the lab. It's been a kind of project. Um, I don't know. So the morph, there is those carrots. Um, so my favorite project, uh, it's the morphing control surfaces or wings. That was funded by several projects by Airbus. And we actually have a really big Airbus horizontal elevator. It's, this is the horizontal elevator, which is in the back of an A340. So all that gray up against the wall, it's tapering. Uh, yeah, so it's part of half of the tail of a commercial aircraft, a moderate sized commercial aircraft. And it's 26 feet long, weighs about 250 pounds, and it's all made out of carbon fiber composite. Um, for comparison, we have an aluminum and steel uh, wind tunnel model that weighs well over twice that. Uh, I think it's like 2,000 yeah. pounds. Yeah. Yeah. So it's pretty heavy. Um, Don't want to fall on it. So it shows just how lightweight modern aircraft have become. <laughs> So as far as internships, I, um, Carson's, like I said, he was in high school when he, he uh, through the Virginia Governor School. Um, so he started his junior year of high school, right? Um, so we've, and I've had several high school students over the years uh, work in the lab as part of their uh, the program to the school. Um, and, you know, there's always opportunities during the summertime. And so that's usually that's not a problem. High school level courses. I don't, I don't think I had a choice in my courses. Um, I didn't have much of a choice. I didn't have much of a choice. It was such a small school. Nah. <laughs> I guess not. Nah. So is a good answer. Yeah. yeah. Study. Do good in school. I think it's important to be aware of if you take AP classes knowing which ones you can transfer to tech. Um, so I don't know if they still do it, but uh, physics AP classes typically don't transfer in for credit attack. Um, so that's something to be aware of. So you don't have to take it twice. Um, <clears throat> college, that's a question. Well, I, I basically did what I recommended you. I went to as an undergraduate, <clears throat> I went to Dr. Palazzolo and knocked on the door. I was interested in controls, and I said, hey, um, I'd like to um, uh, do some work in the lab. So he had me working on a NASA project, and my job, he found out I was really good at breaking things, was to break amplifiers by pushing them or driving them to the, the limit. So I was good at burning up amplifiers, and I still am good at it. Very good. Why don't you want to be? <laughs> And do you require any? No, I mean, depending on your level of experience or where you're at within your program, you try to tailor the uh, project for your level of experience. So, I mean, Carson's still only, I'm only letting him come off the floors, right? That's about it. I'm thankful for that. <laughs> so, but, oh. Well, We've got about 10 minutes, but we don't have to go all the way to the end. We probably have some other ones coming up as well, activities. Um, so I would like to say it's a pleasure. I'm glad that you were able to join. Um, if you um, come to Virginia Tech, uh, feel free to stop by. I'm in the ugliest building on campus called Randolph. You can't miss it. Um, and I'll be, I teach sophomore and junior uh, classes. So I teach an electronics class in the fall. So if you come in the aerospace department, uh, I'll probably be the one of the first ones that you see. But welcome, and uh, we'll, it was a pleasure meeting you, and we'll um, keep dropping on again. Yeah.